All righty. Hello there. Wow, what a great group. Um, so I am going to be talking about the uh, now noted groundbreaking. I'm looking, oh, which button? It's a really big green button with an arrow on it. So this should work pretty well. So first I wanted to acknowledge that we had 10 uh, member organizations who um, hosted a full table. So if you're wondering why these folks have signed and get to sit closer, um, it's because they, uh, they uh, signed up at least six people and hosted a table. So a special thank you to all of these organizations. Hopefully next year every single table is going to be assigned because we have so many people signing up. But anyway, a special thank you. And by the way, if you're a member of one of those organizations and sitting in the back, you're missing your seat that is actually up here. Uh, so a special thank you on that. Um, this is um, the report. I'm going to be talking, I'm going to be excerpt, excerpting data from this and talking about it. And what I'd like to do, it, time permitting, because we have to end at noon, but what I'd like to do is um, take questions as we go along. And if it starts seeming like we'll run out of time, then we'll hold, hold questions. But I think it's really hard when you're talking about data to say, gee, I wish I had remembered that, that on that slide. So uh, we had another record year, and by the way, a lot of the slides are here, but some of the slides are different, and some of the content's slightly different, just to show you a, a fresh perspective. Um, but this is the slide that we show you every year. We added a, a new bar, 12.4 uh, um, is, the, is the new number, and so um, record, 12.4 billion, sorry, record um, growth. And actually, someone pointed out in the board meeting, that the ups and downs of the growth of the profession are reflected a little bit in the ups and downs of our revenue um, as an association, and that's not a big surprise. Um, so um, this is the first time we've done this particular chart, and I wanted to explain it. So um, we have historically received um, actual data from a limited number of members. This year we expanded it and we received data from a much broader group, and so we're able to provide more insight. That said, um, we've also asked for the first time, what's the mix of business between executive search and leadership consulting? It's showing 5%. I will say that for the purpose of this year only, we excluded Corn Ferry's groundbreaking um, uh, acquisition of hay, uh, which really sort of changed the game there. Um, that would have influenced that 5% average uh, by at least by 10 points, but we felt that it didn't reflect the broader profession um, but, but duly noted that Corn Ferry's acquisition was very substantial. It was done at the end of the year and wasn't included in this particular mix. It was included in everything else, but in this particular mix, we felt 5% was more representative as an average, understanding that we do have members who are higher than that average um, and lower as well. Um, this was, I, I thought, a more, inter a more interesting new analysis. So historically, we received data from four um, firms, uh, the four largest uh, global firms. And this year we received data from a number of additional firms um, beyond the four, including, um, I'll just list them, also partners, Amrop, Boyden, um, Hydric and Struggles, Corn Ferry, Rogers, Bernson, Panorama, Russell Reynolds, Shepherd Hayward, Signium, Spencer Stewart, Stanton Chase, TransSearch, and then we estimated market share for Egon Zender because we had one number, a public global number. We counted the number of consultants they had in every single region. We allocated that number out for uh, an estimate, um, and so we put in Egon Zender. Uh, we added Caldwell Partners, who is public, and so we added their information, and we also had an estimate uh, from Whit Kiefer, not their actual data. And so what was interesting to me is that for the first time, when we look at the, 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 it says the big five, I actually think that the one on the left is the big four, because um, I don't think that includes Egon Zender, um, but maybe it does. But in any case, it, the, the mix changed um, from um, the Americas being 46% to the Americas being 41% and Europe and Africa actually being 44%. So it was very interesting to see that when we broadened the data mix of global firms, um, that the mix changed and the slant uh, moved more towards Europe um, than we had seen before. So I thought that was a very interesting piece of information. And it might be that because we were basing it on, on historically on four US multinationals, um, that we just have a little bit more insight um, with the top firms, AESC member firms, and selected others um, to, to get a different perspective. And again, if you have questions, raise your hand as we go through it. I'm happy to. <coughs> take questions, answer questions as we go along. Um, 
So our, our research, we, um, we did a few things. One is we did a member outlook survey, so we asked all of our members to give us their uh, views. We also did a special member survey of member firm leaders, so we asked firm leaders specific questions. Uh, we, um, we did candidate, uh, candidate survey using the Blue Steps database, and we had a remarkable 2,500 responses to that, which was pretty amazing. Um, and we also did selected client, uh, we did a client survey, and we did client interviews. So we got data from a number of different sources in addition to getting hard data from a much broader range of members. So what did clients say? Um, and so I, I thought this was, there was some interesting insight and what we tried to do is look at different questions. So on the left you see what were the top five client challenges now? And on the right you see how do clients use external advisors? On what issues would they use external advisors? So we tried to com compare these two things. I thought it was interesting to see that the number one issue that was raised was a lack of diversity among, uh, you know, for their executive talent. Lack of key leadership su successors, competition for talent, a mismatch of current talent and future strategies, and a need for digital expertise. If you look at the right, the top five ways that clients think they will use, that, that clients use external advisors, there's a very good match. It may not be in the exact same order, but there's a very good match between what, th what keeps them up at night in terms of executive talent issues and how they use outside advisors. Uh, we tried to tease out a lot uh, regarding how you use outside advisors, and not only for executive search, but on broader leadership issues. So then the next question is, well, wh what do you think the issues will be five years from now? How is this going to change? What was interesting is that um, the number one issue today is lack of diversity, and five years from now, it didn't make the list. So we can speculate. Why didn't diversity make the list? And our speculation is that clients are optimistic that they will actually um, solve that issue and that they will, um, they will be able to. Um, Richard, you have a lovely table over here that says Audrey's Bernstein. <laughs> Sorry, that's, we didn't, I don't think we completely made it clear. Richard's a board member and a, and a very good one at that. So um, uh, in any case, so we think that clients are optimistic um, that they will finally resolve the issue um, of, of diversity and therefore it's no longer a top challenge. However, when they look at their current work uh, executive team and leadership group, the, the issue that bounces up to number one is aging demographics. So while that may not be the number one issue today, they're looking at the, the group that they have and saying, well, five years from now they'll be older still, and we see that as the number one challenge. And, and again, how does that change how they'll be using external advisors? Um, you'll see that they, they have a different mix here, and they didn't necessarily identify aging demographics, um, but they did identify leadership succession which is a direct correlation, I think, to that issue. And they also uh, identified shortage of technical expertise, which I think is an outgrowth of an aging demographic. You, they're aging out, you're losing your technical expertise, and, and it needs to get replaced. So there's a correlation between that. And we put this together, um, I'm gonna go backwards. Yeah, we put this together, maybe I won't go backwards. Um, so that you can begin to think about, as you do your business planning, you know, what are the tools that you have that help clients with these issues, both today and what, they're th what they think they'll be worrying about five years from now. So the next thing we did is we said, very focused on um, our business, executive search. We wanted to know, what do you see as the sweet spot for executive search versus um, any, you know, versus in-house recruiting, which is that turquoise bar, or um, RPO, which is orange, or uh, contingent recruiters, which is uh, uh, the dark blue. And so we're on the purple side, and, and it was encouraging to see when you look at the criteria um, that our sweet spot, spot is C-suite positions, board recruitment, higher pay, 300,000 or higher, cross-border searches, confidential searches, hard to fill. It drops down as the comp gets lower um, in terms of where we fit. But what's interesting is that with the exception of the bottom bar, which is people that make 100 to 200, we, um, we are viewed as, uh, 
a more likely choice than in-house recruiting, and this is by clients, um, in every other category. Um, what's also interesting to note is that in-house recruiting exceeds contingent recruiting in almost every category. And so we, uh, and you'll see a little bit more about contingent recruiting later, but as in-house recruiting continues to grow, they still see a very specialized, uh, high-level place for executive search, but it looks like they're seeing less space and less need for space for contingent recruiting. So um, that chart, it's, it's very complicated, but it's also in here. But I, I thought it was a good visual just in terms of seeing how that number changes. Um, but you can see that uh, they're still very clearly, even those who have in-house in talent teams, see us as the right place for, uh, for the higher level positions. Uh, we also asked a similar chart, um, same colors, um, which is when you think about the criteria, what else do you look at? And, and so for selection, access to difficult to reach candidates, professionalism, confidentiality, objectivity, the ability to attract diverse candidates, reducing risk, all of those were stronger for us, um, executive search, than for in-house talent. Where there's a shift to the other side is on operational issues such as speed, ease of use, cost, and then I will mention to you candidate retention, we sort of got this, what I would call sort of aha, strange, what does that really mean issue. Um, I don't think they're saying that we have stronger candidate retention, but that we don't select executive search because of their ability to retain candidates. Um, that said, I think we have some interesting statistics on that towards the end of this presentation. Um, so when it comes to speed and ease of use um, and cost, Clients think they're better at that than executive search firms are. Um, they are faster, um, easier to use themselves, and um, less expensive. But in every other category across the board, um, we are viewed as stronger um, than in-house recruiting. And also in-house recruiting beats contingent recruiting even on categories such as speed, ease of use, and cost. So um, how do clients select an executive search firm? By the way, these screens are really great and they're really far away and I can't see them so I keep going backwards here. Um, so in case you're wondering about it, um, how do clients select an executive search firm? The number one issue that clients noted was the consultant's industry and, and functional expertise. Number one. Number two is almost the same, but it's the firm's industry and technical knowledge and, and, and functional knowledge. So those two things are the number one and number two criteria. The third is being a trusted advisor. And I was heartened to see that pricing showed up as fourth rather than first, second, or third. Um, I figured it would show up somewhere, but it didn't show up until fourth, and it certainly is well behind um, the consultant's industry and functional expertise. Um, and then, uh, interestingly, consultant reputation wasn't rated as highly, and, and maybe that's because it's harder to measure and, and count. Um, uh, you know, it's only a supposition. But again, the top three reasons um, that the criteria they use in selection are consultant's expertise, firm's expertise, and being a tr having a trusted advisor relationship. That trusted advisor relationship is obviously, we have a long relationship with a particular person slash firm, and they know us and we trust them. And so that is, is in the top three and highly valued. So then the question is, how do you measure success? How do you, the clients, measure success? So number one, by a lot, was the business performance of a successful candidate over time. So by a lot. Now, it's hard for us to have statistics on that. It's hard to track statistics of business performance um, over time. Um, but it is, um, it, is, it is important to understand that the ultimate measure isn't how fast or how cheap you are, but rather is the successful candidate su you know, enhancing the business performance of the organization over time. The second one is tenure. Tenure is, a, I think, a, a, short -term a short, shorthand metric for success with the idea that if they've been there for a while, they probably are working out okay. But it's not 
I mean, there's a big gap between 70% and 41%. Uh, so tenure is number two. The third is time to complete. So why is that so high? I think it's when you're, when you're working on assignments for the most important and impactful positions in an organization. They clearly are anxious to have those positions filled quickly. It's not an arbitrary, gee, I wish you were faster, but you know, we can't do without the right person. And every day that we don't have the right person costs us money. And so time is really an important factor. And then the fourth metric was having a diverse slate of candidates to choose from. So those are the four metrics that our clients have ind indicated are the most important to them um, out, of all, uh, out of a wide range of metrics. So if you work with it, this is a, uh, now we're trying to tease out a little bit about leadership consulting. So we said, if you're working with an executive search firm, would you consider using that firm for any of the following services? And we gave them a long list of services. And what we got is, and we had a choice of yes, maybe, or no. And um, what I thought was really interesting and encouraging is how big the maybes were. I think maybes are the real opportunity. Yes, we, yes is a clear opportunity, right? If, they, if they're absolutely, uh, would, would consider this as a yes, great. But you have a huge group of maybes of client organizations who are saying, I'm open. I'm open to having a discussion about this. I'm open to learning more about other services my trusted advisor might offer. Um, the no's are clearly, you know, your, your hardest sell. But the yeses and maybes, the yeses range from 30 to 39 percent on this list of five, and the maybes range from 40 to 46. So you add up those two things and you can see three quarters are really yes or maybe to open to services such as succession planning, compensation strategies, board advisory services, internal talent assessment, internal man interim management, um, and the maybes also added leadership effectiveness and executive coaching and organizational effectiveness and some overlaps as well. So to us, this was a picture of the opportunity ahead beyond um, the very important, highly valued executive search work that we do, but the openness to use executive search firms on a broader basis for leadership talent issues. So that was the end of the client perspective. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about what we heard from our members. And some of that we're actually going to compare member responses to client responses. So first of all, our members are optimistic. Um, and we asked them about optimism in a few different categories, about the global economy, about the country's economy, and about your own profession. And so um, the, the, there are certainly, on the less optimistic side, the, the there are concerns about the global economy and the country economy. I guess the good news is there's less of a concern when you look at optimism about your own firm and the profession itself to weather the storms of any uh, uh, country and, and global economic challenges. And so overall, uh, pretty good optimism, either no change. And when I look at no change and think, well, is that optimistic? Well, considering that we just had another record-breaking year, if you are as if you have no change in your optimism from 2015, and 2015 was a record-breaking year, I would say that sounds pretty encouraging to me. And so um, at least no change means I think it's going to be as good as the most recent record-breaking year. Um, and so we also think optimism is reflected in hiring plans. And so we asked, are you planning on hiring more executive search consultants? 52% said yes. Are you planning on hiring more researchers? A third said yes. Are you planning on hiring leadership, people who specialize in leadership advisory work? 24% said yes. And so I think hiring plans for 2016 reflect the optimism that we just saw. Uh, they're optimistic enough that they're investing in their business and they're investing in a, a new talent, both from the core business of executive search, but also in new areas around leadership, uh, executive search and researchers and new areas around leadership advisory work. So we also asked firm leaders, so AESC member firm leaders, what is your focus for 2016? What do you see as your top priorities? 80% said we need to build stronger relationships with clients. 
my number one priority, strengthening the overall relationships we have with our clients. Number two is increasing our focus on business development. I want to focus on my clients and I want more of them, more clients. Uh, number three is increase speed to placement while maintaining quality. I think that goes back to the issue we identified through the clients, which is clients are putting an enormous pressure on us to fill quickly these most important positions they have. They need these people, they have high impact, and they want us to help them get the right people as quickly as possible, and we see that pressure. So 54%. 43% uh, said leverage technology better to increase effectiveness, and then 39% said an increased focus on marketing, which probably ties to, to business development as well. And so, um, but again, the number one is building strong relationships and then increasing the number of relationships we have through business development. So how do client and member views compare? Uh, we looked at how the top services clients use and the top services AEFT members see themselves providing. And so strategic planning, interim management, executive coaching, compensation strategies, organization effectiveness were all identified by clients and our AESC member firm leaders um, identified areas where they thought they'd be um, growing uh, succession planning, board advisory, internal talent assessment, executive coaching, and interim management. So there's some good matches here, but it's not a, it's not a match for match. Um, and so, um, for example, compensation strategies is obviously a high, um, a high on the list. Uh, uh, Corn Ferry is well positioned with the Hay acquisition to do that, but that is an area where clients see um, a definite need for outside um, advisory work. Organizational effectiveness is another area um, that has typically fallen into the category of management consulting. Some, some of our firms are doing some of that on a limited basis, but again, it is, it is an outside need that is identified by clients. Um, and again, we also ask the same question in terms of future growth. Um, the idea, the clients identified those things on the left, members identified those things on the right. And again, there's, there's not a one for one match, but succession planning definitely shows up um, on both sides. And it's just interesting to think about what clients are saying, what we're seeing in terms of growth and development and how those things match up. So we also ask candidates um, for some insight on their experience working with executive search. And so we ask them two things. One is, what is it that they value the most out of the relationship they had with the executive search firm? And where are the areas which they wish that would improve? What's interesting is our strengths are our weaknesses. If you look at the areas they value most, um, so there's an overlap between that and where they want more. Um, so uh, assessment of skills, they value, they value the fact that you, we're good at assessing skills, we're, we're professional, we offer good company insight around the client organization, and we are strong on relationship building. They wish they had more from us on culture, uh, the culture of the organization that's being considered and how they might fit with that. They wish that they had more communication from us. Um, they wish they had um, more help in terms of negotiation and more help in terms of onboarding. I want to give a comment on onboarding. Um, so uh, candidates wish that we did more on onboarding. We ask clients out of a long list of things to consider where onboarding fit in and it got zero, which is a pretty low score. So candidates wish that we did more and clients aren't necessarily seeking more from us. Interesting. Um, candidate, uh, clients might say, got that part covered, don't really need additional onboarding services, thank you very much. But the candidates are saying, I really wish we could get more from you on this. So I thought that was an interesting insight in looking at the two together. Um, we, also, we also asked, did you get your re most recent job through an executive search firm? Um, and have you been here, how long have you been in that position? So, and the, the top answer was three years or more. And so, it w I can't say this was a dramatic um, difference, but it was a noteworthy difference, and that is 
those who were placed, and we asked them, by the way, we gave them a list of AESC members, a link, and we said, if you were placed by an executive search firm, was it someone from this list? Was it an AESC member? And um, the tenure, those who had three years or more, 47%, um, so there was a higher uh, retention by those placed by AESC members than those placed by other search firms or in other, other ways. So it's not a huge difference. It was interesting to tease it out a little bit, but it was, at least it was interesting to say, well, maybe we are pretty, you know, maybe we are better at retention. By the way, it doesn't mean that 53% left. It just meant they, they had a choice of how long they'd been there. And, and so, yes. That mic is not on, but that's Hi, okay. Dr. Sheikha, I may have missed this, but where did you find the people? Blue Steps. It was on Blue Steps. Okay, right. Fine. So we have a hundred thousand, over a hundred thousand uh, candidates in uh, Blue Steps. We surveyed them, and we were uh, really delighted that twenty five hundred responded, which was really good, a really high response rate. I wish our members had responded to the same level that candidates had. Any other questions on that? All right. So that's. Let me just. Pause for a minute on the survey. I keep pushing the wrong button to go back. Well, maybe I'm pushing it the wrong way. Um, so let me, I, I'm going to introduce my staff and do a little bit of a close, but I wanted to stop for a minute to ask you, um, did you have any questions about that or, or were there any, any insights in there that you, 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 they were ahas for you or, or, or questions? Or are you simply, oh, there we go. Go back. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Karen, could you go back to the original slide? I just wanted to see those numbers on the global. Uh, the twelve point four billion. Twelve. I'd love to see that again. If I can, sh I mean, I can try. How about if I get the guys in the back to go back to my first? It's really my, uh, I think, second slide, all the way back. That's why I'm having you do it. It'll be faster. <laughs> Keep going. There. Oops. One more forward. One more there. It should be in there. Um, just one, one more. Uh, it should be uh, <laughs> page six. There we go. Thank you, Bill. I was just curious about the numbers. I didn't know it was in there. Thank yep, you. there we go. Other questions? Anything? So I wanted to take a moment um, to acknowledge the team and to make sure you know who they are. So there we are. We got back to the, to the right place. And so I'm going to ask each of them, and I'm going to embarrass them by asking each of them to stand up, um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about who they are and what they do. Um, it's just going to take a minute. But Ethan, I see you in the back. So Ethan is uh, responsible for technology and operations. He's responsible for all of the technology that, that fuels both AESC and Blue Steps, including, well, really everything you can imagine on that, including all the reporting uh, that goes with that. So. Ethan, thank you. And Ethan actually works remote out of Philadelphia, but is in the office uh, one day a week. Um, Catherine. Catherine is our longest serving employee. She's been with us for 20 years. Um, she is responsible for finance and administration. She's the person that helps folks like Dinesh, um, both in terms of presenting the reports, but also providing the necessary background. And she's done an amazing job for us over 20 years. Um, she is going to be leaving us at the end of this month, but I wanted to do a special acknowledgement and thank you to Catherine for 20 years of amazing work. So, thank you to Catherine. Um, Glenda, back there. So Glenda is, um, a, and I think you're the second longest serving of the directors. Um, Glenda is responsible both for Blue Steps and for partnerships. She, run, she manages over half the revenues of the organization. She works very, very closely with, with everyone, but particularly with Ethan and with Joe, who I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, but when it comes to Blue Steps partnerships, um, Glenda is, Glenda makes the magic happen. So a uh, thank you to Glenda. Uh, Joe. There he is. So Joe is responsible for marketing and communication. How many people have seen our new website that was rolled out last summer? If you haven't seen it, AESC.org, please go there. Joe made that happen uh, and his team. Um, we had a very ambitious project of completely re-engineering the face we have to our members, but importantly to the client community. Um, Joe told me he could deliver it 
um, by July of last year, I honestly didn't believe him. Um, it, was, it was huge, it was ambitious, um, and I, I kept telling people third quarter, figuring, well, maybe by the end of September. He, I know he said July, but I, I probably the end of September. In any case, he delivered it on time, um, exceeded all expectations as far as I'm concerned, and is supported by uh, other people in the marketing group that are here. I think Ben is around somewhere, and uh, people who know Ben, I should do a special call out because Ben is responsible for executive talent. Ben, stand up for a second. Um, so J Ben works with Joe. Ben is responsible for executive talent. Um, he is the guy who has helped us re-engineer that. Uh, Joe and Ben together made this happen, um, and I'm, uh, I have to say I'm pretty thrilled, so thank you to them. Who do we have? Uh, Brian, the man who hardly needs an introduction. So Brian is responsible for the Americas region. He's also responsible for the Global Conference and for governance supporting the board. Um, and Brian has done an amazing job, I think, in this conference, and we have attendance. It's far more um, than last year, and I think we've got a great lineup of speakers. So, Brian, thank you. Um, I'll <laughs> the next person is Claire, who's somewhere around here. Claire? Claire is our newest employee. She started Monday, so she's <laughs> really new. Um, and actually, she technically started Sunday because she was working on Sunday, so I guess you started Sunday. Uh, Claire uh, lives in Brussels and she will be the new Regional Managing Director for Europe, Israel, and Africa. She joined us by, uh, by way of the conference board and is bringing uh, a fresh perspective to the regional role and uh, what a great indoctrination to spend a week in every kind of meeting you can ever imagine. So a special welcome to Claire. And so uh, raise your hand if you're in Europe, Israel, or Africa. All right, those are all the people that need to say hello to Claire sometime today. Claire, you're gonna have to memorize every one of their names. All righty, and then finally, uh, last but not least, is Patrick. There's Patrick in the back. Patrick is responsible for Asia Pacific and Middle East, um, and uh, he's also responsible for our educational program. I should mention, Brian is responsible for Cornell, which we've relaunched this year, and uh, we had uh, exceeded all expectations in terms of um, uh, sign-ups, and we have a truly global cohort. Uh, Patrick runs the rest of education, um, from researchers to consultant education, and including our newest senior consultant education that we're going to be rolling out and kickstarting to, uh, tomorrow. Andrew Sobel is going to be, do we're doing special uh, consultant education, and if those, uh, those of you who want to attend tomorrow from 10.30 to 12, Andrew will be doing sort of a snippet of his overall uh, approach. He's always um, highly valued, and I believe in your badge, there's a special promotion around the um, Andrew Sobel um, e-learning e program. Did I get that about right, Patrick? Um, Patrick is the first um, region managing director that we've had for Asia who's actually in Asia. Um, he is in Hong Kong and works very closely with Steve Mullinger, so thank you to Patrick for everything you do for the organization. So that is the leadership team. I did want to take a minute to introduce you because um, these are the people and the people behind the scenes who really make everything happen um, and without which we couldn't be making the kind of changes we've made. Um, I'm ending three minutes early, but the next slide. Uh, we already went through questions, so the next slide says that it's time for networking lunch. Please visit our partners. I mentioned Glenn is just responsible for the partners. We've, uh, Tom announced the partners earlier. Um, our partners are, um, are here for your benefit. Um, they want exposure to you, and we highly value them, and they help fuel the programs that we bring you um, through their partnership dollars. So enjoy your lunch. Network, not just with the people at your table, with other people, and we will see you back um, for the beginning of the session at 1. 12.45 is what I meant to say. So thank you very much. See you at 12.45.